Hello and welcome back. Um, so we are talking about uh, the idea of patriarchal culture in Ambai's uh, kitchen in the corner of the house. And in the previous session, uh, I talked about uh, uh, the set of um, beliefs that seem to uh, structure the kitchen in a particular way. So we need to uh, uh, think deeply about what are the different set of beliefs that makes the kitchen the way it is uh, in this household um, in, in um, Ambai's story. So uh, what is the set of beliefs? What is the rationale behind the dark kitchen? kitchen why does it have a zero watt bulb why is it not brightly lit why is it not a, a tangible physical concrete place for the men folk why doesn't it strike uh, uh, them in that way and what is the ideology that um, structures the kitchen in this particular manner so all these questions need to be asked and uh, What's interesting about that particular description that I uh, read out in the previous session is that uh, there is no uh, conversation uh, um, in that particular description uh, happening between the women folk. Uh, the noises that seem to emanate uh, come out in that space is about slapping and kneading and stirring. So all these activities are um, uh, associated with the physical labor, the slapping of the chapati dough, the kneading of the dough and the stirring of the spicy dal and, and um, women, the women folk who work in that uh, uh, space just become hands and, and remember all the colorful dresses become dark and they become faceless and identity less and it and, and just the the activity uh, makes us realize that there is a set of human beings doing all these um, you know tasks so um, there is a crisis in the family in this uh, story um, in fact we need to remember that this story is very episodic uh, it's not a neatly structured story uh, along the lines of uh, Kushwan Singh with a with a very structured mid, uh, beginning middle and end uh, it, it this is a story with a sort of a, a, a conclusion with an epiphany uh, at the end of the story but uh, it's very episodic and, and in the first episode, uh, there is a minor crisis and this is the crisis. Papaji, the head of the family, the father-in-law is building a, a new room about the garage and um, the daughter-in-law, Meenakshi, who's from the south, um, she's from Mysore uh, and, and she's the wife of Kishan. Kishan is an architect um, and uh, Meenakshi asks for an extension of the veranda outside the kitchen um, and she says that it will be great if they have a new uh, uh, basin uh, for washing the dishes um, to the left and then um, perhaps a new set of aluminum wires for drying the clothes, uh, uh, you know, uh, behind that um, and, and that is the crisis. Her request becomes the crisis and uh, she uh, in fact requests a restructuring of the household and that's something we need to uh, make note of. Here we have a woman who is suggesting some kind of uh, changes to the way this uh, this home has been uh, laid out and as I said um, she's a native of Mysore and this um, space in which the story unfolds is in Rajasthan. So she is an outsider and other uh, in, in this particular family as well as in that uh, region and, um, and the father-in-law asks why do you want this extension, what, what's wrong with the present uh, you know, um, set of um, uh, pre present structure in, in the kitchen and she says that the basin in the kitchen is extremely small and the drainage is poor. If the servant woman washes the vessels there, the whole kitchen gets flooded. And Papaji, if you hang the clothes outside the window, the mountain is hidden. So she offers two good reasons as to why instead of a room about the garage, an extension of the veranda outside the kitchen is ideal for um, a smooth functioning of the family. And um, 
if you recall the previous session, uh, at the beginning of the story, the narrator mentions that nobody seems to mind the inconvenience of the kitchen, and suddenly there is this a woman, this new, uh, this uh, daughter-in-law uh, called Minakshi, who seems to mind uh, the discomfort, um, the the the. the um, and the displeasure that um, you know that that arises from being in that space, and she voices it out. And uh, let's see what uh, the reaction is. So, um, as I said, she offers both physical and uh, spiritual uh, reason uh, for uh, having an extension. And her husband, Kishin, who's a skilled architect, according to the narrative, endorses her view uh, because uh, the father turns to him and asks, what do you uh, say to her request? And, and he agrees. Uh, he endorses um, the request. And he asks quite um, archly, when did you go near the kitchen? Um, and and he and um, Gigi says that uh, when she cooked us that Mysore style meal, it was he who sliced the onions and uh, chilies for her. It seems as if it's a grave mistake, a misstep on the part of this man um, to help uh, his wife in cooking a Mysore style meal. So he had diced the uh, onions and, and 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 cut the chilies for her and. Um, Papa G is almost scandalized and he says, it, it seems we might as well present you with a gold bangle and be done with it. So you need to be inducted, you know, the, in the proper way by being given a gold bangle and, and, and we can finish, um, you know, with this whole idea with that. And um, it's very interesting, you know, the way he insults his son, um, if, if you think you know giving someone a gold bangle is an insult um, because um, gold bangle is associated with uh, with femininity you know with femaleness with female identity and here he the father says that you know we can give you a gold bangle because you seem to be interested in the kitchen and um, so he he is somehow uh, symbolically initiated into femaleness just because he helped out, just because he shared in his wife's labor, wife's labor in the uh, kitchen, and uh, therefore um, you know the idea seems to be that uh, cooking or being in the kitchen or assisting in the cooking process is seen as effeminate, unmanly behavior, uh, according to the ideology of this particular man, Papa G, uh, in this story. Story. So um, that's the comment he offers uh, to his son, and um, what uh, and and um, the, the, how does this battle between Minakshi and uh, the Papaji, the head of the household, resolve itself? Uh, we see from the narrative that the request to extend the uh, veranda is a uh, fails. It fails she doesn't get her veranda and she doesn't get a new basin she doesn't get um, aluminum wires for drying clothes uh, and um, instead a couple of nylon wires are added to the set that are already there outside the window so her request for spatial and visual freedom and uh, um, and, and, and a kind of a freedom from that restrictive labor fails that that battle is lost by Meenakshi. In fact, there's no change in the state of the kitchen. And as I said, two more nylon wire, uh, lines were added for drying clothes, making sure that um, the women of this home do not get to see the green mountains or the temple uh, for Lord Ganesha from um, where they are inside the kitchen. And it reveals the meanness uh, of this figure, Papaji, uh, you know, the narrow mindedness, the, the bitterness that he has for. Um, the request of um, these women who who dare to voice out their needs and um, his behavior is an assertion of uh, patriarchy patriarchy is fighting its way back uh, it's making sure that his uh, its space is not eroded and that the status quo is maintained and this is a beautiful, uh, I, I'm using the word beautiful in an ironic way, and this is a beautiful retort, a silent retort by Papa G, uh, who thinks all these thoughts, it's his thoughts by the way, he doesn't spell it out, but um, the narrator 
captures uh, the male psyche, uh, the repressive male psyche in Papaji's um, you know, in, in Papaji's uh, mind, and he says, "Woman, woman of Mysore, who uh, who uh, you who have not lived here for many generations, why do you need mountains? Why do you need its greenness?" What possible connection is there between Rajasthani food customs and the window and the washing up basin? Dark skinned woman, you who refuse to cover your head, you who talk too much, uh, you who have enticed my son. So um, you can see a lot of uh, angst, resentment um, spilling over in those um, thoughts of Papaji. Um, and uh, we can really see the state of mind of this man, this uh, older authoritative figure who's at the head of this family. And he's deeply, deeply resentful um, of this female outsider, Meenakshi from Mysore. And um, he has a grievance against her for um, uh, all these things, preferring a view of the mountains, her desire to interact with nature, which seems to take her out of this female identity. Uh, she, um, a female uh, is not supposed to enjoy all these things. She's supposed to just be in the kitchen and cook food whenever she's asked to. So um, how dare she has a, a desire of her own to look at the mountains, to enjoy the greenery. And, and um, you know, and uh, she, the, uh, Papaji also nurses a grievance against her for refusing to follow the rituals of Rajasthani customs such as covering her head um, uh, with her dress uh, with her um, outfit and then um, you know she is also um, he's also resentful uh, uh, against her for her complexion. That's a very interesting uh, thought there on his part. Let's go back to that uh, uh, statement there. Dark skinned woman, who you, ref uh, who you who refuse to cover your head, you who talk too much, you who have enticed my son. So um, she, he hates her, dislikes her for talking too much, for refusing to cover her head and for being dark as well. And being dark as well as for enticing, tempting the son. Um, and we can guess that um, Meenakshi and uh, Kishan's um, uh, marriage is, is not an arranged marriage. We can speculate because uh, there is a sense that she has tempted Kishan, she has trapped Ki uh, Kishan, uh, and um, since it's, it's, she's from Mysore, we can speculate that this is a, a, a romantic marriage and not a, um, a, a, an arranged one. So uh, this excerpt is, is a very powerful one um, that, uh, that reveals or lays bare or highlights um, the various fractures that are there in the psyche, in the male psyche, in terms of an outsider, in terms of a female who speaks out, in terms of a female who has a power over her husband, a power which makes her get his assistance in the kitchen, uh, in, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, making, her, uh, making him, uh, you know, um, dice uh, onions or, or, or her making him help in preparing a dish. So um, all these are looked at with a lot of bitterness on the part of um, you know, Papa J. So that's the episode uh, and that's the crisis. So now uh, let's move on to uh, another uh, s uh, episode and this episode is about uh, Bari Gigi and uh, Gigi. Gigi as I said is the wife of uh, Papa G and Bari Gigi is Papa G's stepmother and um, apparently his father, Papa G's father married Bari Gigi when uh, she was just, um, when she was a 17 year old and uh, uh, now let's look at the uh, relationship between these two women, uh, the stepmother and um, you know uh, the daughter-in-law, uh, the 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 uh, the chief. Uh, I mean the mother-in-law uh, of the uh, other women. Okay, now uh, when grandfather was alive, uh, Bari Gigi ruled absolutely and tyrannically. Uh, Gigi needed mountains of chapati dough. She sliced baskets of onions and kilos of meat. She roasted puppets in the evening while uh, Bari Gigi uh, drank her kesar kasturi. She made the pakoras. Then grandfather died. Within 10 days, Gigi was thrown into power. So, um, when um, 
Bari Gigi's husband was alive, she was the queen of uh, the kitchen. Uh, you know, and this young uh, wife, this young mistress was um, absolutely powerful within the home in terms of the kitchen and Gigi who was just uh, a daughter-in-law then had to do much of the um, hard labor and, and the narrator says that she had to knead mountains of chapati though uh, that so much was her labor and she did so many other tasks and, be, uh, and, and Bari Gigi uh, enjoyed her herself by drinking uh, Kesar Kasturi, that um, hard spirit and um, once her husband died, once the grandfather died, uh, within 10 days Gigi was sworn into power. Look at the uh, look at the metaphor there, the metaphor of a new ruler uh, assuming power in the kitchen. So um, the daughter-in-law has become powerful uh, there and the mother-in-law loses her power because her husband is no more. So why did Bari Gigi rule absolutely and tyrannically to begin with? She is the uh, second wife of, of the head of the household then and why was she absolutely and tyrannically uh, powerful? Why does she lose power on her husband's death? So it becomes clear these two questions make us realize that the power that Bari Gigi has is not her own power. It's the power that she derives from her husband. So which is why uh, when he is around, when this older husband is around, much older husband in fact, because um, the narrator says that there was um, uh, Bari Gigi and Papa G, um, uh, they were uh, of the same age. Uh, both of them were 17 years of age when um, Papa G's father married Bari Gigi. So, uh, the, the, the point that I'm making is that Bari Gigi is not powerful on her own. Her power derives from her husband and once he is not around, once he is dead, she loses power and the woman who has, the, uh, has, uh, who has this living husband uh, becomes the uh, next big power center in the household because her husband is around. Her husband is Papa G. So uh, she becomes the new queen of the kitchen. And what happens after Bari Gigi loses power, um, she lost her rights to kumkum, uh, betel leaves, meat and spirits. She also lost in the matter of everyday meals. So look at the fall from power. It's a really drastic, it's a really drastic fall from power in fact. She, enjoy, uh, she, uh, she enjoyed all this while her husband was alive and she doesn't get to enjoy these when he is dead and gone. So, uh, and, and my question is why does she lose out even in the matter of food? Uh, she was um, a, a meat eater but once her husband is dead she has to become a vegetarian. Um, so um, the, the understanding is that um, that is the unwritten rule of the family. So if you become a widow you are supposed to give up the pleasures of life. So she becomes a vegetarian and she also gives up the drink um, that uh, the women of the household enjoy, that hard spirit, that case kasturi that everybody consumes and she is just given potatoes that vegetarian dish and um, and, and here we have the humor um, in, in the narrative when um, Bari Gigi has her own way of taking revenge on um, you know the people who have uh, you know uh, thrown her aside in terms of the power dynamics. So how does she take revenge? Um, she re takes revenge through bodily noises that she releases and um, it, it becomes an embarrassment and a disturbance to those around her. So she breaks when she belches because she consumes a lot of potatoes and um, that's one way to take revenge uh, for uh, losing um, out in the, um, uh, in the power struggle between um, herself and Gigi. And there is another way as well uh, through which uh, she uh, takes revenge on uh, the others um, and Gigi and that's uh, through a spiritual means. So every uh, once in uh, six months apparently she is possessed by goddess Amba and uh, once she is possessed and she is always possessed when the rest of the family especially Papaji and Gigi are enjoying their meal and enjoying their drink and um, what she does is she you know commands 
everyone to give her, um, you know, lots of barfi, lots of um, meat and drink, kesar kasturi, and then she shoes them, uh, shoes them away and says, leave me alone. And then she locks herself up in a room and enjoys um, all the uh, variety of dishes that she gets as goddess Amba and she makes a lot of celebratory noises. So that's how, this is how she takes revenge on Gigi once in a while by, um, you know, by becoming possessed by goddess Amba. So, uh, and, and the narrator um, says with a uh, tongue in cheek, uh, it's, uh, the narrator says that it might have been uh, possible to bandy words with Bari Gigi, but Gigi did not have the courage to question Amba. So, um, Gigi, the, the new mistress of the household, the wife of Papaji, might, uh, you know, uh, attack Bari Gigi, um, the once queen, uh, but um, once uh, she becomes possessed by goddess Amba, she doesn't have the courage to question um, this woman. So, um, it's interesting the way uh, uh, Bari Gigi, the woman who had lost her power, resorts to the higher authority of the goddess Amba in order to, uh, uh, you know, in order to take a revenge against Gigi and enjoy um, the pleasures of life that she had lost um, uh, after the death of her husband. So, um, how does uh, how does Lakshmi Holmstrom see uh, the power struggle that takes place uh, through the idea of food in a kitchen in a corner of the house? And um, she says that this story examines the mother-in-law's illusory authority in the kitchen and the establishment of a hierarchy within it, and how that authority can be subverted through food wars. So. Um, in the case of uh, Bari GJ, um, you know, uh, that hierarchy uh, is subverted through, uh, you know, the physical way uh, in which she takes revenge as well as through the uh, spiritual means. Um, and um, according to Lakshmi Holmstrom, that authority uh, can be subverted um, through these food wars that happen uh, between the uh, uh, women. But um, the other interesting thing that we need to uh, make note of is the fact that, um, you know, there is a lot of enforcement of authority and the consequent pain is uh, prolonged for um, the women who are uh, not at the top of the hierarchy who are uh, at several levels below um, uh, below that highest authority. So Bari Gigi, who was once the queen of the household uh, of the kitchen, does suffer and, and she does have to, you know, act in uh, crafty ways, in strategic ways in order to uh, enjoy some of the uh, foods that she enjoyed while she was, um, you know, uh, while she was uh, the mistress of the house. Now, um, Gigi, who is the uh, new uh, mistress or who is the reigning mistress of the kitchen, um, you know, uh, is, is a little bit sick and she is no longer as powerful as she used to be and um, but she still um, controls uh, the kitchen she is still the custodian as well as the oppressor she's clearly the oppressor of uh, of Bari Gigi her um, you know and uh, her um, a previous boss, uh, in fact, so she takes um, her revenge in whatever means that she can, uh, and uh, Gigi has absolute control over the spices cabinet, which uh, which she keeps under lock and key. And the narrator says that you could not get to any of these things, all these uh, spices, cloves, and cardamom, and, and and cashews, without going past her. Before that, um, before that, you were subjected to a severe catechism. Why did you need the ghee? What happened to the ghee I gave you yesterday? So all these questions were asked to the uh, woman who wanted to use the spices. And um, further questions uh, came at the person who wished to use the spices cabinet. What are you cooking for the vegetarians today? Wasn't there anything left over for them from yesterday? What's the use of just eating and then going to the toilet? So all these questions were asked by um, Gigi and um, the target of all these questions are uh, is Bari Gigi in fact because she is the only vegetarian in the family and look at the way she asks I mean why don't you uh, use 
the leftover from yesterday to feed this old woman who's toothless? Um, what is the use of um, her just eating and then going to the toilet? So look at the um, harshness uh, behind these questions. So we, we just have two women here on the battlefield. You know, we don't have a man and a woman on the battlefield. We just have two women. Uh, and, and one of them has been the previous boss at the kitchen and the other is the new heir to the kitchen. Um, so. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a uh, you know um, um, it's an infight that's going on in 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 terms of the fact that these are women fighting between themselves and why are they fighting um, between themselves? That's the question that we need to ask. What what is the hierarchy that they have? Why um, from whom do they get these power? So uh, they don't seem to realize that the power that they have is is, is secondhand power, temporary power, the power that derives from the men folk who are outside of this kitchen space um, and, and uh, who don't even consider the kitchen as a physical space. It's just a set of beliefs for the women to, um, you know, work with. So um, the, all these undercurrents are there, ideological undercurrents are there behind the way in which Ambai has structured these conversations, these thought processes. So uh, the questions that um, uh, Gigi asks um, anybody who wants to use the spices cabinet is a is, is not a, a, a little question about the amount of spices somebody wants to use. It's a question that signifies the patriarchal authority um, of the of the men folk of the society and and um, all these details the the nuances of the details about the uh, about cardamom and, and cinnamon uh, in, in in this context point to the power um, that's there in men who seem to you know keep the women busy by giving them pseudo authority about all these um, issues and and keeping them engaged through all these infight things and all, all these power struggles about who is the boss, who owns the keys and things like that. So this hierarchy in the kitchen is, is, a, is, a, is a kind of a false hierarchy, but it's a hierarchy all right, but it, and it's a hierarchy which, har which harms as well the, the people who are vulnerable in this hierarchy, but it's a hierarchy enforced by, um, you know, constructed by the patriar uh, patriarchal figures uh, in this home and in this society. And, and Bari Gigi is the victim now. Now, she is the victim now, but she was the uh, perpetrator of, of um, uh, horrors previously when her husband was alive. So there is a kind of a cycle of oppression that keeps uh, going on and on uh, with, with regards to the women in the space of the kitchen in homes. So uh, again, we have a fantastic, um, you know, uh, psychological uh, understanding, sociological understanding of the uh, dynamics of the kitchen on the part of Ambai, and she makes her narrative say that uh, from the dimly lit narrow windowed kitchen there were hands reaching out to control like the eight tentacles of the octopus which lives in the sea they reached out to bind them tightly tightly and the women accepted their bonds with joy um, let me continue. If their waists were bound, they called them jeweled belts. If their feet were held back, they called them anklets. If they touched their foreheads, they called them crowns. The women entered a world that was enclosed by a wire on all four sides and reigned these and reigned there proudly. It was their kingdom. They made they made earth shaking decisions. Today we'll have mutton palau. Tomorrow uh, let it be puri masala. So. Um, it's a fantastic passage again, uh, in the sense that um, the narrator clearly, um, you know, uh, tells the reader that um, uh, there is a uh, there is a kind of uh, an octopus-like, uh, um, uh, like monster in in the kitchen, which which uh, reaches out to all its victims and it binds them tightly and tightly. And even after being tightly bound, the women accepted their bonds with um, extreme joy. So that image of the octopus is, a, is a, a fantastic image, a very disturbing image. And we need to ask who that octopus 
is um is it the women is it the men or is it both with men conditioning the women in such a way that they kind of harass the inferiors who are beneath them so um, that that question needs to be asked what is that octopus who is that octopus who are the various octopuses who kind of um, you know suffocate the joy out of the women who are in the kitchen and again once again you need to a look at the sarcasm with which the narrator um, describes each and everything. Look at the way she describes anklets. You know, if if the feet were held back, if your feet were tied, that was called that's called the anklet. That uh, um, the thing that ties the feet is the anklet. And if if the head is bound, that becomes the crown. And if if the waist were tied up, that becomes the jeweled belt. So all these jewelry become um, these uh, elements of uh, incarceration and imprisonment and the women enjoy these uh, various aspects of imprisonment uh, in fact uh, you know um, the entire women folk seem to be um, you know within a, uh, an, a fence uh, a fence of four walls uh, of a wire fence uh, a really horrible wire fence and they seem to think that a uh, space is their kingdom and they are the queens the, ra and the, the rulers of that kingdom and they make these big decisions as to what they're going to cook to Today is it going to be mut uh, mutton pilaf today, and is it going to be puri masala today? And these decisions seem to be earth-shattering decisions, and there's a lot of irony in that remark. And um, as I said, the authority in the kitchen, the decision decisions made by the women in the kitchen, and the personal and uh, adornments, the jewelries, uh, become bindings, become um, incarceration devices for women in their space, and and that uh, space is a dark space. A dark place and that dark place is called the kitchen. Um, thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session. Have a good day.